him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife. Please join me in the prayer of invocation. We read this responsively. Holy and loving God, to you alone we lift our souls. In you alone we place our trust, we wait all day long. For you are the God of our salvation, abounding in mercy and steadfast love. Help us remain alert and watchful for the coming of your promised one, the one who comes with power and glory, the one drawing near to bring our salvation. We are glad, yes, we are so happy indeed to be together in the presence of the Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to say when they pray, our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The Psalter is in your bulletin. It is responsive, and so please turn there. Those of you who are joining us at home, we invite you to, to participate as we go through the order of worship. We appreciate those that we are hearing from that watch the broadcast. We got a, uh, we got contact, we had contact this past week with some people who live in Stockton Springs and, so, and winter in Florida, and they watch the program, and there's so many others, and we're glad that you're joining us. This is the historic Elm Street Congregational Church in Bucksport, Maine. I am Dr. Stephen York, your minister. Please turn to the Psalter, and uh, it is responsive.
It is a Psalm of David, the 103rd Psalm, verses 1 through 13, and verse 22. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. He revealed his character to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him.
Thank you. Please be seated. The colic is in your bulletin, and it actually is an expression of what we just sang about having our eyes open. And I'll comment on that a little bit into the preaching this morning. The colic is the prayer that we pray, asking the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and to help us to hear and understand, to believe and to obey. God's word. I invite you now to join me in unison. It begins with the words, blessed Lord. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning is Psalm 22, Verses 25 to 31, it was the Psalter last week, and I felt impressed to have this as the Old Testament lesson. I would like you to particularly pay attention to verses 30 and 31 as we go through this lesson this morning. Hear the words of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. <clears throat> Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow down before him, all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Notice 30 and 31, please. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. Thus endeth the reading of the Old Testament lesson. The liturgist will come now and read the gospel. The gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And then one of them, Cleophas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. 
What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, he said. He was a prophet who died, who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. And then some women from our group, from the group of followers, were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. And then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay at night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and he gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within an hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord is really risen. He appeared to Peter. And then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. This is a post-resurrection story. It happens the evening of Resurrection Sunday, Easter. Like others, these two walking on the road to Emmaus found it hard to believe that Jesus was literally alive. So <clears throat> they have walked, or they are in the process of walking from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus. We only know one of the names of the two. It was a couple, a man and a woman, and Cleopas is the woman. And as they are walking toward their home in Emmaus, Jesus begins to walk with them. And God did not let them see in the beginning who it was or to understand it was Jesus. I want to say a bit about Cleopas for a moment. I think one of the reasons that God didn't let them see who it was that was talking with them was because Cleopas was a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she would have known him instantly if her eyes had been clear. But see, they were, they were already confused by the conflicting reports that he's dead, but he's alive. Angels, body missing. And so 
you'll notice that another thing about Cleopas in the gospel is that she was one of the women at the cross. Now, interestingly enough, for the most part, all the men were missing in action except John, who wrote the Gospel of John. And as I referenced to the children this morning, it was to John's care, this young disciple who's probably now about 20 years of age, it was John's disciple that uh, the disciple to whom Jesus deeply loved and he committed the care of Mary to him. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. You'll recall in a previous message that I preached, the term woman was not a pejorative in that day. It was a title of respect. And so when they are addressing Jesus is addressing his mother and John and says, woman, uh, it's, it's one of affection. It's one of respect. Secondly, the other, there were a number of other women that were nearby at the scene of the cross, and Cleopas was one of them. So Cleopas had a first-hand view of the crucifixion of Jesus. And being a relative, this was not just Jesus, but it was a relative. It was a, like a nephew of hers. And so now they're walking home. It is seven miles. Remember that. It is seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And it was downhill on the way home because Jerusalem is up high and it's elevated. So our story opens and here is, uh, here is uh, this couple who are discouraged like the many other disciples, and particularly the 12, they had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. They had hoped that he was the one that was going to get them out of the problem with the Roman Empire. But that was not the plan. And so when they are uh, walking along, they're talking about the events of the day. You'll notice in verse uh, 14 and 15, like any other married couple, they're debriefing. They are having conversations about what happened. And anyone who knows that experience, past or present, knows, you, you know, you start about with how was your day or whatever. But they had been together in Jerusalem and very affected by this event. So they're trying to understand it. It's okay to not quite yet get how the resurrection works. Because even though they were close to Jesus, these disciples, they yet were to understand what it all meant. And so Cleopas and her husband are two of those, and they're processing things about everything that had happened. And as they commune together, verse 15, as they commune together, when a couple are close, it's not just perfunctory conversation, but they are in communion with each other. It's not just facts of the day, but it is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And so they are processing, they are communing, and they are reasoning 
They're trying to reason. I want to suggest to you this morning that trying to reason ourselves into believing that Jesus literally rose again from the dead is not how it works. It's a work of the process in one's heart. And so they're trying to reason, they're sorting it out. What do you think of this? And maybe this happened, or maybe Rome came and, and stole the body, or whatever. And, or maybe the women were having a hallucination. And what's up with Peter? He's sort of a hothead, and he was down there, and you know, he's quick to speak and slow to listen and quick to anger, and who knows? Maybe they didn't get it straight. And what's with the angels? And so Jesus drew near to them. This is Easter evening. He drew near to them and went with them. Before we clearly understand Jesus Christ, He's near to us anyway. He's there and he's present in our lives, whether we recognize that it is Jesus who walks with us through our daily living or not. When we come to faith, we begin to realize all the time Jesus was there, but you know, we're not clear. We're not always seeing Jesus in the moment. Sometimes it's life's difficulties, life's problems. Clearly these two were disappointed like other people were disappointed. And sometimes Jesus appears to us in the times of deepest grief and disappointment and sorrow and you can't just figure things out that have just happened. Have you ever been there when you've been in a situation where you just couldn't figure it out? It doesn't make sense. How many times in our life lives have we said, this doesn't make sense. This was not the way it was supposed to happen. That's where they were. But Jesus drew near to them anyway. He not only drew near to them, but he began to walk with them. One of the favorite hymns that we sing in this church, and I don't even need to take a poll to ask this question, is the hymn, In the Garden. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share is he tarries there none other has ever known. Just because we have lapses in faith or disappointments or life has not gone the way we thought it should go, I want you to know that Jesus is always near us. And when we finally get our eyes open and we sang this in preparation for the message, open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. What is the truth? The truth is that Jesus is not only near us, but he's walking with us no matter what our problems are. No matter what our history is. No matter what we thought about Jesus. And even if we don't understand everything in the Bible, Jesus is near us. Jesus is walking with us. Sometimes it's the garden and sometimes it's on the road to Emmaus and life is a journey, isn't it? We don't know where it's going to end. We can't really safely say we know how today's going to end. I mean, we think we know, but then the inevitable can sometimes happen. And so 16 says their eyes were holded. That means they were closed. They did not know him. He said, what are you talking about? You're walking and you're so sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, this is the woman, 
answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's come to pass in the last few days? Well, you must have been living on another planet if you don't know what's happened in Jerusalem. Everybody knows. I want to say this morning that most people in America know this story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But because they can't reason it out, because they can't put it in a mathematical formula, because you can't quantify it scientifically, somehow they can discard it and say it's not real. But I want you to know this morning that God is greater than any scientific evidence. God is not limited to our mathematical formulas because the living Christ is the one who reveals himself to people and you can't quantify it. And so Jesus goes along with the story in verse 19 says, well, what happened in Jerusalem? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, and indeed, mighty in word and deed with all the people. And our chief priests and rulers condemned him to death, and they have crucified him. It was the religious leaders of Jesus' day that conspired with Rome to get Jesus crucified. Think about that for a moment. It was the religious people, the leaders of the Jews, religious leaders who conspired against Christ in the Roman Empire. We thought that he was going to redeem Israel. That means he's going to put David's throne back in order. And some of the women astonished us. They tell us the story about the empty tomb. But they didn't see him. And Jesus then speaks, having listened to this, and he says, you really are foolish. Have you, ha, have you forgot? You're really foolish because this was written in the Hebrew scriptures. And the Bible says Jesus took from Moses all the way through the prophets and revealed himself as the Messiah's to be expected. But they still didn't know it. He testifies from the scriptures. When we are not sure what to say about Jesus, it is sound advice to go to this book. Jesus revealed himself through the Old Testament, Moses and all the prophets. So now it's getting late. They're tired. But Jesus feigns or acts as though he is going to keep on traveling. And the Bible says they, they urge him to come in. It's late. Have a meal. Stay the night. So Jesus agrees. And he goes in to their home. A meal is set before him. They're ready to partake. They're ready to partake the meal. But before they do, Jesus takes the bread. Follow this. Jesus takes the bread and breaks it. And in that moment, they recognized who had been talking with them. And he was gone. I want to suggest to you this morning that one reason why the communion 
service is so vitally important in the life of the Christian church. It's not just going through the motions. It is an opportunity when the bread is broken and the cup is received to, to encounter the living Christ, to come to know the bread of life. And when we have communion in this church, and I break the bread and remind you that he is the bread of life born in the house of bread of Jerusalem. It is an experience. It is an opportunity for us to experience Christ and remember who he really is. I referenced at the end of Psalm 22 this morning in the Old Testament lesson. I'm going to read the last two verses again. Our children will serve the Lord. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. That's why Christian religious education in this church is important. That's why in a few moments the children are going to come up. They were instructed, many of them, during the Monday Thursday service of what the Lord's Supper means. And they'll be brought up and they will too receive with their parent, parents' permission to come forward down the center aisle and receive communion. Why are we doing this? We're teaching them about the Lord before it gets too late to reach them. Because if you get into your teenage years and you haven't encountered the living Christ, you got peer pressure, you got the attraction of drugs, you got the attraction of living loose lives with alcohol and all kinds of other problems. But communion is what opened the eyes of Cleopas and her husband and then they stopped the meal and one hour later they were going back up seven miles to Jerusalem and when they got to the locked room they knocked on the door and said he is really risen from the dead. So this morning as we receive communion let us be mindful that it is yet another way to encounter the living Christ, to have our eyes open to what he did for us in his death, burial, resurrection, and in his promised return to us someday. Amen. Our hymn is 65 in the red folder. Let us stand and sing it. Let us break bread together on our knees and the children. Jeanette, please. Thank mm -hmm. you. to the rising sun oh Lord have mercy on me let us drink wine together on our knees let us drink wine together on our knees I fall on my knees, her face to the right. 
rising sun. Have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together. When I fall on my knees, afraid with the rising sun, O oh Lord, mercy on me. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to go to prayer. And we have a number of requests for prayer this morning. The family of Esther Bowden, who would be little Sadie's great-grandmother, uh, one of our Sunday school children, passed away yesterday. So prayers are requested for the family. We have a request from the Freckers. Uh, Barry is not feeling well, and Joanne Frecker uh, left a message. She'd like to have prayer because of a procedure that's coming up for her on Friday. We have other requests. And Abigail Terry with a non-accidental brain injury who lives up the street. Um, it's a real complicated need. And so there's prayer for that request. And Joyce Grand, who has stage four cancer of the lymphatic system. And Kathy Chamberlain, who needs a liver transplant, which is not easy to get. We have a praise report that Lori's sister-in-law, Lisa and friends, Keith and Glenice are all doing well and thank us for our prayers. There are prayer requests also on the back of your bulletin. Uh, one of our members suggested me, to me last week that when we pray about Ukraine, we ought to also pray that the rain season starts because it will complicate what Russia is doing when it's a lot of mud and whatever. I don't know all the details, but it was pointed out, so let's pray for rain for the Ukraine. Let's pray for our nation and our leaders who are making tough decisions. Let's pray for the people of Ukraine and their president and all the nations of the world. Let's pray for them. Uh, Joanne McCann, uh, Joanne uh, Jackson this morning uh, needs our prayers. She came, set up for coffee hour, and had to go home because of a problem with her foot. So please pray for her. Are there other requests you would like to mention this morning? All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you hear our prayers. This is not perfunctory. We're not doing it just because of tradition, but we believe that there is a living Christ who cares about human beings. And we ask that you be with these names that have been mentioned, the situations around the world that we have referenced. And we ask that, oh God, that you will bless those who have need of our prayers. We also remember John McCann this morning out on the West Coast who is in need of our prayers and all of those on the prayer list and those who are at home and cannot be with us. For every person that's ill, be with them this morning. We give you thanks for the good reports, for the progress that has been made in people's lives. We commit this town, this church, and our lives 
and pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. The offering plates are in the back table. Um, you may place your offering there. I want to say we appreciate those of you who are sending your financial support through the mail. You may write your checks to the Elm Street Congregational Church, Box 878 in Bucksport, Maine. We'll stand for the doxology and the prayer of dedication. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We read this in unison. We give in grateful thanksgiving for all that God has given us. In the upside down world of the gospel, we measure our wealth not by what we have, by what we can give away. Let us give away generously in this offering to bless our church, your people, your creation, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our communion hymn is 254 in the Pilgrim Hymn Book, Break Down the Bread of Life. Thank you. Please be seated. The liturgy for the communion is the last page in your red folder. I call us to confession. The confession of our sin 
before God and one another reminds us that as individual believers and as a community of faith, we do stray or turn from the ways of love and justice. We believe if we confess, we shall be forgiven and freed from the burden of guilt and empowered to carry on the ministry of Jesus the Christ. Therefore, with confidence in the mercy and love of God, let us pray the prayer of confession in unison. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand to affirm our faith as is expressed in the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The breaking of the bread is an opportunity to come to remember and to experience the living Christ. Jesus, at that meal on the road to Emmaus, did what Cleopas and her husband had known he had done many times before. He took the bread and when he had broken it. Their eyes were open. Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise also he took the cup and he poured in it and said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. The word testament means covenant. No more the need for the blood of bulls and animals to be given as a sin offering. Jesus died once for all. This is my body, 
this is my blood. Do this as often as you do it, as often as you do it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to come to the center aisle and you can receive by intention or we have a COVID free um, opportunity also. Thank you, let's receive the Lord's Supper.
The prayer of thanksgiving is the, the bottom of the communion liturgy on the back. I invite you that are joining by way of the internet to join in with this. It is a prayer of unison. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At the conclusion of this service, um, I'll be standing at this door over to my right to greet you. I want to let you know that, I don't know if he's hiding or what, but it's Joey Valenzuela's fifth birthday. So this afternoon, there's gonna be a little party for him in Brown Hall. Uh, children, you'll, the children will have a ride waiting for them as soon as the communion service is over. Now as Moses blessed Israel, I bless you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. The sung response. Please stand as you sing it. <laughs> 